I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Roger Nelson, the founder and director of the Global Consciousness Project. He studied physics at the University of Rochester, experimental psychology at New York University in Columbia, and is the author or co-author of 75 technical papers and two books. Roger was professor of psychology at Johnson State College in Northern Vermont, and later joined the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab to coordinate research. He created the Global Consciousness Project in 1997 and is a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. So, Roger, welcome back. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Well, nice so to see you. Today, I, I wanted to talk about the original Global Consciousness Project, as well as the new GCP2 network. There's been some confusion, and this is something that I didn't know myself until just recently. So I think a lot of people aren't aware that this project is going to a new level. But let me start with an overview for the audience, just in case they're not familiar with it. Uh, Global Consciousness Project is a long-running experiment to detect interactions of consciousness with physical systems by detecting a change in the output of random number generators that correlates with major worldwide news events. So the original project that you ran, that lasted 15 years, right? And you had remarkable statistics from it. It actually ran, it is still running, <laughs> So it's 25 years, but the formal experiment, um, which was set to have 500 tests of a general hypothesis, that ran for 17 years. Ah, okay, okay. Well, and that was one of the reasons that my my numbers were off because I know it is still running. You're still collecting data, and actually, I'll put a link in to both the, the original GCP website as well as the new one so that people can go to the website and look at the data. Again, absolutely remarkable statistical correlations mm -hmm. that you've, you've been able to put together. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I don't think I should be in the business of do, doing corrections necessarily, but when I started the Global Consciousness Project, I wasn't thinking of mind and matter interaction anymore. That was what we did in the pair lab. To, we were creating and testing tools uh, of that sort. So when I started the Global Consciousness Project, that was left after <clears throat> close to two decades of this prior research. My um, object, my intention, was to see if I could capture any in, 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 inklings at all, any like preliminary suggestions of what Teilhard de Chardin called the noosphere. In other words, a kind of layer of intelligence, a global consciousness. So I, I thought it was possible because the, we had been doing things like that in the lab and then outside the lab with group uh, consciousness experiments. And they were amazingly uh, enlightening. Basically what we learned um, first was the mind-matter interaction is real. The second thing was that group consciousness is real and has functional effects in the world, not just intentional uh, changes on, on the part in the experiments in the laboratory, but if we went out into the field to um, look at something like a ritual uh, with a group of people who are, who become coherent, we would see changes in the data. And um, that was um, the real background for setting up the Global Consciousness Network. Um, after doing these, what we call field REG experiments for a while, it became clear that there, there was a good reason to believe or look for a consciousness field and that that consciousness field could be global in scope. Well, so, yeah, no, it, it absolutely remarkable work. And you know, the thing that the thing that just truly excites me about this is you've you've taken something. I mean, these consciousness effects, right? These happen to everyone. You know, people have dreams that come true. They they have feelings that turn out to be correct. 
Um, you know, and many times the specific details of these things are so accurate, right? I mean, we, we've yeah. all had those moments where it's like you just stop and go, how could that possibly happen, right? So, I mean, this is something that, that humanity as a species, we, we feel like I mean, we call them psychic effects or consciousness effects or whatever. This has been part of our species for millennia. Yeah. And you have the first project that's really collecting hard data and statistical correlations on it. And that that's why it's so incredibly important because, you know, it's it's one of those, for me, I, I feel like it's one of those things that has gone back and forth and people say, well, yes, it's happening. No, we can't prove it. No, it's just psychological. You're collecting data. You're doing statistics. Nobody else has really done that other than very small correlation studies well in the laboratory there's been a lot of work but you're right uh, in terms of uh, something like a global consciousness or group even group consciousness um it's pretty new but you know you say um you're talking i think uh, giving a very correct picture of the way we are we have experiences and they include some experiences that are hard to understand they're, they're, they include things that we for which we don't have an explanation. So there's some subset of us who work uh, on, you know, pro things, how to understand things. Uh, the scientist guys, right? So a lot of scientist guys don't believe that there's any such thing as the experience that people have of knowing something is about to happen and then experiencing that, you know. So um, it requires uh, for the science-minded to do some well-designed, um, properly run experiments. And that gives us then a chance to not only uh, sort of demonstrate that it's real or prove that it exists. Uh, most scientists talk about getting evidence, not proof. <laughs> anyway, it also helps to confirm and then ultimately to understand the personal experiences that we have, which are often profound. Well, another thing for me that's really exciting is the mechanisms that you've put in place to collect this data. So as I understand things, earlier experiments you'd done used a variety of systems to show that consciousness affected these random, basically random event generators, right? And in fact, um, I'd even heard about something that was like a mechanical pinball system that would drop <laughs> thousands of tiny balls into slots and the distribution of balls depended on, uh, depended on consciousness. But GCP yeah, right. itself- actually, They weren't tiny balls. They were three quarters of an inch in diameter. Oh, and this okay. machine was huge. And we called it Murphy after Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. <laughs> it yeah. I loved it. <laughs> I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, I, I the so the, in terms of GCP, though, it's a fully electronic system. And I mean, right around the beginning of the internet, right back in the 90s, when the internet was just getting exactly. going, you had a system that was, you had nodes, I think it was up to 70 nodes, different, basically different systems that were collecting this and sending the data back to a central database where you guys were doing analysis. So mm -hmm. this was very, very advanced and it's fully electronic, which also makes it really exciting because there's this scalability aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, Interesting. I, um, I'm an, sort of an, I'm old enough to have watched the internet be born, actually, and then um, I had this magnificent opportunity to do work that had to do with consciousness and interactions with uh, machines and random numbers and all of that, and the thing these things kind of flowed together, um, so that the global consciousness project, which I wanted to do. Uh, was designed just in time or the other way around. The internet arrived just in time to allow me to do this thing. So I was able to place random number generators all over the world in all continents except Antarctic. We never got one there. And um, collect a, a rather large archive of data of parallel streams of 
numbers that are they're random and there's you know they're created by professionally designed uh high quality research grade random number generators so they're really random they the, the numbers are really random most of the time but if we look during special events when a huge number of people come together in a kind of coherent uh sharing of emotions especially then we would see changes from randomicity in our data this swath of it's like i used to think of it as a as a kind of tapestry unrolling a random tapestry would suddenly uh, begin to show patterns which is what you hope of a tapestry right <laughs> and well, um yeah go ahead well, I was going to say, so examples, for again, for, for people who may be not familiar with this, uh, September 11th would probably be a great example, right, in, in a horrible way. But yeah. um, so that that would be one example. But there are also positive examples, right, like holidays, like Christmas and New Year's. Right. Yeah. We uh, we knew that we would be looking at New Year's every year because it's a great gathering of people. And it, it isn't, um, it's a celebration of nothing. <laughs> it's a celebration of a moment. <laughs> you know, it's only, it's just defined by this um, transition from one year to the next year. What is that? But it's an occasion when very large numbers of people come together to share a, a drink, perhaps, to share a loving hug just at the moment of midnight and so it was a perfect kind of occasion for our purposes which was to try to find out if great masses of people joining together in a coherent way if that um gathering of consciousness and emotional states in uh huge uh numbers of people if that might actually show up in our data and the answer is yes, indeed, it does. Both the tragic things like 9-11 or the Haiti earthquake or uh, the tsunami in Japan or even things um, which might not quite seem like global event events, but if a very much loved person dies, there's a, an upwelling of um, a shared emotion, Some something like... Uh, grief or uh, maybe love and compassion. In any case, a lot of people pay attention. And we found time after time, people like Michael Jackson and Steve Jobs, and also uh, the popes, two or three of the popes were um, either died or were elected. And uh, we, we would look at those as events where not everybody in the world by any chance, but large numbers of people would come together with the kind of um, emotional uh, coherence. Now, from the last time we talked, and I, I don't I don't have the best way to express this, I guess, but you described basically doing statistical analysis on this data that's collected. And again, this is coming in from a network. It's not from a single device. But when you guys uh, cross-correlate this, average it out, and do the statistics on it, as I recall, this is basically millions of times uh, more statistical effect than random chance would allow, right? And that's the part that I'm not expressing well. But... Uh, um, it's a little hard to conceive almost. But what over this 17-year-long experiment, we had 500 separate tests of the hypothesis that when people become coherent, there may be a change in our data. And so that was that's the basic question we're asking in one event after another. It might be the positive event or a negative event. But in any case, we then could uh, ultimately look at all of those uh, event outcomes. Sometimes we were would, so to speak, win the bet. Um, because we have to make a prediction ahead of time. Is it going to be a positive trend? And that's the prediction we would make. And then we find that um, actually something on the order of two thirds of the time we were right, it would be a positive trend. Not necessarily overwhelming, but consistently a positive trend over so many of these um, 
individual tests that when we put them all together, that it, they, you know, there is uh, power in numbers. So we gathered more and more evidence and the evidence tended to say, yes, it's a positive outcome. And by the time the 500 events were, um, you know, gathered and analyzed, we could see that the um, difference from what's expected for random numbers like these was so large as to be what the scientists call a seven sigma effect, seven standard deviations away from, you know, the bell curve. It most, you know, the most of the events fall in the middle, some will, maybe one standard deviation out, a fewer two standard deviations. This was seven standard deviations out from what you expect by chance because of the power of repetition and doing the same experiment again and again. Yeah. So then, and the odds against chance are trillions, three trillion to one, that, they, that anything like that should happen in random data just by chance. Okay. So we get you. <laughs> three trillion to one. Again, yeah. absolutely remarkable. And one of the things that I've wondered, I, I approach this from more of a hard science perspective, but um, to me, it seems like the fact that you're using quantum Zener diodes to measure these statistical effects, would it be correct to say that this is quantum in nature, do you think? Well, that's a good kind of question, but a hard one. Yeah, and I'm not asking that, that, right. That all works, you know, and we don't know what quantum even means, really. And, and But you're, you're right. The devices that we use, these random number generators, they, they are based on a quantum process, which is utterly unpredictable. And what we're doing is, is the equivalent of flipping coins, but a very high speed electronically. So what we want is for the next um, throw of the coin to be utterly and completely unpredictable, no matter uh, whom you ask, even including the device itself. It doesn't know either. That's the meaning of the quantum basis for these random numbers. There is no way, the future doesn't exist yet. The future outcome <laughs> doesn't exist yet. And so um, we can use that um, that utter unpredictability to create you know, endless sequences of numbers, which are also therefore unpredictable. And if they become slightly predictable, if something changes the way these numbers accumulate, then we've got an, uh, some evidence in, the, if you do the experiment right, we have some evidence that in this case, consciousness entered into this generation of randomicity to make it slightly less random. People talk about entropy. Um, when a random number generator is designed and is working correctly, it is fully entropic. It has no structure, no predictability at all. And if it, um, if we do something that adds neg entropy or reduces the entropy, then we have got evidence of an interaction of, in this case, mind and matter. Well, and so what I have written down here is that the random number generators are controlled by reverse biased Zener diodes, which rely on quantum tunneling. And from, right. from what I understand, basically electrons pile up inside of this and there is a kind of a quantum process that happens and it is a statistically random. It is a, what would you call it? Scientifically unpredictable. It is quantum yes. in nature. Um, yeah. You have this breakdown where they start to tunnel through and it generates a completely random signal. And then your team, right, when you built these devices, you shielded these and you also tested that shielding from solar radiation, from radio waves, RF signals, all sorts of stuff, even like power fluctuations in the grid and things like that. So it is absolutely and completely random, you know, by, by all tests. And most of the time it behaves that way. But then again, yeah. when these moments of coherent consciousness happen, that randomness decreases and that's yeah. what's measured. And that that's the three trillion to one that you talked about. 
That's right. Yeah. And there's an, um, an interesting quality to the measurement that we actually use for the global consciousness data. Remember, we have many uh, streams of data that are parallel. And what we, the calculation we make is, is the variance across that, um, that, uh, that sequence, set of um, parallel sequences, okay? So let's say we have 60 of these devices reporting data. So we have 60 streams. And we, if we look across in one second, we look across all 60 streams, we can cal calculate how much they, how much variance or variability they have, and compare that to the um, expected value. So we call that a network variance measure. Uh, can also be thought of as a measure of coherence, uh, which the uh, GCP2 team prefer to use. And um, what's most interesting to me is that it's also a measure of correlation among these devices. So if you think of two of them going like this, they, they're uh, correlated with each other. If they're you know, kind of randomly related, there's no correlation. What we find is that the increased variance is pretty much the same thing as saying there's an increased correlation, shouldn't exist at all. These devices are thousands of kilometers apart, mostly, and they are made carefully made uh, by experts in producing uh, random devices. They, they should not, they should be independent, <laughs> but they become correlated because we are here. Well, so one thing I wanted to ask about was, did you notice any time delays in effects? I know this is difficult to measure, but time delays in effects or, or maybe a tapering off, right? For instance, um, if you have an event that happens in a specific area, do devices near that area show more of an effect? I guess what, what I'm wondering is if if you know, time and space play a role in this. Right. Um, if the answer to that excellent question is a little complicated. If you look at global events, things that involve people all over the world, it's really big uh, and really uh, widespread um, stimulus to emotional states, okay? <clears throat> In that case, we don't see any differentiate, we don't see any difference between uh, the correlations of uh, devices that are um, a couple of uh, hundred miles apart and 10,000 miles apart, they're the same. And, but if it's a smaller event, which has a kind of, you might say local, local audience, more local audience, then we do see a slight decline as the distance mm. between the devices increases. Uh, the new project, GCP2, is taking that slight indication seriously and setting up to be able to really do a, a concrete and uh, pre-planned analysis. Uh, in our case, we weren't... Um, we kind of made the assumption that it was that we were going to be looking at a global effect and the measure was going to be involving all of the devices so that was the you know that was the model that we used for gcp1 gcp2 um quite a few people in the team are interested in getting a better reading a closer experimentally defined reading of how much does distance space how much does space and time uh, affect the system Speaking of time, we have quite a few events in the original project that um, are suggestive that there may be precursor changes in the data, yeah. as to say something like a precognition or premonition on the part of what I think of as the global consciousness. In um, the 9-11 example, several hours before the plane, the first plane hit, there was a, a big, very distinctive change in the in the way the data were uh, piling up, and that is um, and that was we found that also looking at large, uh, at um, you know a kind of complete survey of all earthquakes uh, in the oceans, in on land, but big ones that caused damage and maybe death, Richter magnitude six and greater. And it turns out that they, those uh, on land, show a pattern in much of the world. 
And the pattern is pretty distinctive. It starts something on the order of seven or eight hours prior to the major earthquake, the main Templar. So it's, stri it's striking how often we have seen. Uh, and that's another thing I think the uh, GCP2, the new project, um, will want to look at more closely. What about this idea of premonition? Yeah. Well, and it, let's let's get into GCP two because again, that is uh, the original project. I again, I've been excited about this for decades, and the new project I wasn't even aware of until we did our our last interview. And I went out and immediately signed up for that. I bought a device, and I I got uh, several of my colleagues, and I am pressuring more of them to get involved. And and <laughs> you know, and and the reason is again, this is this is new science. I, I mean, there are so many things that that are extensions out there where people can do a little bit of research that may extend things a little bit. In this case, it's just brand new ground, you know, and GCP2 builds off the original experiment. So mm -hmm. for me, that's been just tremendously exciting. I jumped at that opportunity. Um, yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Well, so with the GCP2 network, actually, a, a company called HeartMath took that over, right? They're actually doing, they're, they're manufacturing the hardware for that. And I believe they're actually doing the analysis and the statistics. So that's based off, that's based off what you originally created, but they've kind of taken it to the next level. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, um, that's the idea. There's a lot of uh, answers from GCP1 what we now refer to as GCP-1, the original. But there are also a lot of questions. There, in, Indeed, there, as often happens in scientific stuff, you get some, uh, you know, you answer your original question, but you reveal half a dozen more really good, very interesting questions. So GCP-2 is designed in large measure to see, to try to, as you say, um, go to the next level. And that means not just asking some more questions like how about space and and time, but things like what about um, the different kinds of emotions? Are we going to see something? Can we differentiate between the really negative kinds of uh, emotions that so sometimes tragically um, bring us all together to the same focus, or uh, versus um, positive emotions, and and maybe even things like um, intentionally designed moments of, let's say, meditation or shared uh, dreaming or any number of kinds of things that uh, that we do as as groups and, uh, you know, as individuals participating in the groups. So um, uh, we're, the GCP2 group is doing some things that, that will um, sort of increase the physics reach um, in particular, whereas we um, recorded in GCP1, we recorded the sum of 200 bits or 200 coin flips. So a number like 100, 108, 10, 97, and so on, streams like that. This The new project will be reporting bits uh, in <laughs> from your device. <laughs> Um, but also reporting the raw noise coming out of the uh, avalanche diodes that are used for as the fundamental quantum source of randomicity. And there's um, a, um, a number of uh, different ways of doing things, what's called whitening, to try to prevent uh, the data from being affected at all by things we find uninteresting, like temperature changes, um, the aging of components, all of that stuff. We want to eliminate that. We did so in the original as well by using logical stage, which, which is called an XOR. You combine the original random data that might be biased with a, a an alternating uh, set of ones and zeros, which will um, enhance the bias uh, going one way, but uh, diminish it or remove it going the other okay. way. So we can completely obviate any kind of um, biases that happen for whatever reasons in, uh, in, in, the, in the data that comes out. So we really want, want to then and now 
to start with the truly random data, because that's, um, you might say, where the bread is buttered. <laughs> if we have truly random data and our analysis shows at some moment in time that's important, uh, if our analysis shows structure where there shouldn't be any, then we have a, a leg uh, to stand on and maybe uh, as we become more sophisticated, a leg to run with. Need more than one, I guess. Well, <laughs> and, and GCP2 also uses each device has multiple diodes running in parallel, right? So it's That's just right. more accurate, more granularity. As you said, you're measuring the noise in addition to measuring the actual random number generator. So yep. it's just going to be higher resolution on each device, right? We, we uh, well, hope so. I mean, the main thing is to see if we can, you know, to, the main reason for having to, 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 basically we start from the beginning of the business of creating randomicity uh, using that noise. That, that noise is not protected by the, you know, the, um, potential difficulties of temperature and that sort of thing. We measure the temperature and we can compensate in the in the, the noise stream, but that's not uh, good enough for true random numbers. But the, the point that we're working toward is um, we hope to find um, the first beginnings of a change from uh, the randomicity that uh, these instruments are designed to have uh, to the structure that we find they uh, sometimes take on when human consciousness intervened. So it's, uh, we want to have the barest beginning and then stages along the way to see if we can capture something about the physics of this business of mind and matter interacting. It's a, it's a very... Uh, challenging problem i was going to say difficult but it's challenging yeah. and as you know um improbable things we do immediately impossible things takes a little longer <laughs> that's where we are <laughs> well, i wondered if uh actually i had a couple of just kind of out there ideas but one of them was i thought if human consciousness affects the zener diodes um, have you ever tried getting the diodes to communicate with each other? And again, I'm not expressing that well, but the thought was, you know, maybe there's a way to, if this is some kind of a quantum behavior, maybe there's a way to affect it using another quantum system. I'm not sure if that's. Yeah, we, we actually did that in the 1990s in the Paralab. We set up one random number generator with another one to be the, what we called operator. And uh, so, and then we looked for correlations of any sort between those two devices, which is a you know very um, simple, maybe you might even think it's crude way of asking the question that you're asking. And the answer was we found no correlations, whatever. There was no human consciousness involved, and um, even though we, I mean, now I would say it's. Um, there's a kind of collaborate, co collaborative uh, quality of in this mind matter interaction business, and and it's coll the, the collaboration exists and is is necessary actually in the experimentation in the kind of um, lab work and things like the global consciousness project. You know, one or two, we have to have uh, and we have to accept that th those devices aren't just out there in the world all by themselves. We put them there. We have a question that we're trying to answer, or a bunch of questions. And so we're collaborators in what they do, I think. You know, we it, it, it's logically necessary that we accept that as part of the picture, because after all, that's what we're trying to prove, that our consciousness in one way or another interacts and makes slightly different the way these things behave and the way the data look at after uh, we've gathered a bunch of it. So uh -huh. it, yeah, so we are we're part. Uh, so I, well, I, get, I get messages in the corners here, but I will ignore them for the moment. 
Well, so another thing I was I was hoping to ask was if you'd ever considered using other quantum devices. Um, so I know the Zener diodes. I mean, there are so many advantages to that, right? They're readily accessible. They're easy to work with. They go into standard electronic devices. But uh, there are also other devices out there. I mean, just such an array of things like, for instance, um, atomic clocks. And, and, you know, that's that's one example that's probably in the expensive side of things. Another example might be like squids, the superconducting quantum interfaces. Again, these are larger, more expensive systems. But I thought, you know, at some point it might be interesting if if someone wanted to attempt measuring one of these to see if they might echo some of the results that you've seen with the Zener diodes. Well, um, the answer to your uh, question is yes, indeed. Uh, those are th there are lots of interesting possibilities and yes, quite there quite there's quite a bit of research that's already been done and other research that's um, you know related to that question which is being planned or is what and yeah, like if you want a kind of really nice survey of that kind of stuff you can talk with Dean Raiden I I think you know him right and uh, maybe you've talked to him before. But yeah, he's looking, yeah. like looking at the um, a double slit experiment where um, there's streams of uh, photons that uh, might go through one or the other of two slits. And depending on uh, what consciousness does in terms of observing the, those photons in some kind of virtual mental space, you know, it's like fabulous. That's, and that's a process which at its base it has a kind it has a um, completely quantum level randomicity and uh, Dean's been able to show very uh, beautifully that human consciousness especially human consciousness of people who have done a lot of meditation for example um, can intervene and can make different uh, the the interference pattern that results than it would have been without those that consciousness intervention. Well, it, it's intriguing because as quantum computing takes off, there is this emerging industry working on quantum devices, and so I can't help but wonder, you know, as they build these devices and get deeper into it, they, whether or not they're in for a surprise, right? And they may arrive right. on your doorstep, so to speak. Uh, it, it makes me think of um, a sort of fairly wild seeming possibilities. One is it's not exactly uh, easy to do something like control what a quantum computer is up to. Maybe they need consciousness intervention <laughs> in a direct way. So they may not, not, might not only be surprised, but also benefited by um, some understanding of what, you know, intention uh, what in, uh, wishes and desires can do in a, con uh, in a quantum context. Yeah. Well, and it, it seems like this does in some ways, you, you might almost call this like the observer effect, right? Or Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, mm -hmm. where consciousness seems like it is an inherent part of these quantum systems. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, a long running um topic of some well, challenging topic in physics, right? And uh, I'm not a theorist, and so I don't uh, try to get into the fray. But um, what I think I'm seeing is that um, the observer effect has been kind of denied at, in, some, in some versions of his presentation. But um, on the other hand, at the same time, there's an increasing recognition on the part of major uh, contributors in physics that consciousness is real. It has to be accommodated. You can't do physics without doing consciousness, ultimately. And uh, people like David Bohm were on, way ahead. They were in the late 80s and early 90s and so forth, writing fabulously interesting uh, stuff about um, the presence of consciousness as part of the universe or and yeah. some people actually go a little further and say write about the universe as part of consciousness well and 
One of the things that I, I tend to think to myself is that all science is social science because all science is done by people, right? And so what you're saying is the same thing, is all science involves consciousness because consciousness is required to do it, you know? And it's something that we overlook because it's just an inherent mm -hmm. part of it. But Yeah, but there's another, you know, another layer uh, or another level, you might say, where consciousness is fundamental in some people's modeling of what, the way the universe is. Like the first thing is consciousness and out of consciousness arises something that like the space time universe that we think of. So it's first consciousness, then universe. And ultimately the people who are asking the questions, that's another form of consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, this is it, tremendously exciting, tremendously exciting. And you know, again, the, the Global Consciousness Project 2.0, when I when I learned about that, I, you know, I just jumped at the opportunity to get involved in that. I am so excited to see what the results are. Um, well, Roger, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has truly been a pleasure and an honor speaking with you again. And let me close by asking, uh, what do you expect to see in the next few months as GCP2 starts to move forward? And do you do you expect to see some like tangible results from it? Perhaps more more data. Uh, well, I I am uh, so I am super delighted that the GCP2 project is well underway, and that there are people like you uh, all all around the world who say yes, I want to participate in this. I want to be a citizen scientist, which means I'll not only host one of these devices, but I will contribute some thoughts and questions uh, to the uh, project. Because we're it, it's a huge uh, question that we're asking. It's a it's a and it's an important one, I think. Where do we fit in this universe that um, our consciousness is, both generates and observes, apparently? <laughs> So what I hope to see is um, a kind of solidification of the of the focused questions that um, that uh, constitute the scientific. It's sort of like the pre-registered tests uh, and multiple tests of um, our notions, and a uh, a gradual sharpening of the of those. Um, preliminary and, uh, and uh, original and startup kinds of questions into really very well honed questions at the next level. So that's what's happening as we speak, really. There are people, I know you have been in touch with Roland, who's a dear friend from long ago, uh, whom I asked, would you be interested in it? Thank goodness, and I am happy about it. <laughs> he was interested in helping create the GCP2 ongoing. So uh, what I expect to see is more of, the, more of the same, but also very different kinds of um, insights coming up from this uh, a team of people, uh, which is gradually growing to include a lot of people around the world. And thank you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, and Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Yeah.